day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's been a beautiful feast so far. Uh, a different one for us. This is the first time we do this uh, online, uh, but uh, we have to uh, we have to be flexible in these uh, end days. Today is the uh, 20th day of the first month of the 43rd year of the 40th jubilee, based on our reckoning of the calendar. Before we start, I would like to um, make uh, an announcement. Uh, I suggested that um, we change the format of our uh, services a little bit, and uh, I was given the green light to uh, to do it. So, uh, with your permission, I would like to uh, try this new format. And uh, if it works, I mean, great. If it doesn't, you can all blame me. And uh, we'll return to the uh, old format. So what I thought that we would do is um, is this. Um, instead of having Wes reading three chapters uh, uh, on, on a particular book, uh, we'll have Wes read one chapter. And then we will um, have the participant uh, uh, give the, they give the participant a, a, an opportunity to uh, to uh, comment on on the reading of, of that particular chapter. So, uh, is there anything that uh, this chapter has has uh, taught us? Is there something that we can learn, or uh, any lessons that we can retain from this chapter, or uh, encouragement or uh, inspiration? So. Uh, what I would like to do is, uh, after, as I said, uh, Wes has read the chapter, um, we can, um, you're, you're welcome to uh, say something, but we want to do, we want to do it in, a, in an orderly manner. So uh, I will be looking at the chat box. And if any one of you has a, a comment or, or, or uh, something to, uh, to say about, about what we have just read, please press the number five. Uh, I didn't want to use uh, uh, something too complicated. I, I, I didn't want also to be too close to one and two because we know what that means. So I, I thought that maybe we would use the, the number five. So whenever I, I would see a number five, uh, the first person who clicked number five will, will uh, uh, after the, the opportunity to uh, to say something, and then and then when we're done, if there's another uh, comment from some someone else, then we'll go in, in order like this. So uh, this hey, is what I would, yes. Um, there is a a raise your hand function in the uh, the meeting. If you if you scroll over your name, um, you should see a little I, hand and I, if you click it it raises the hand so if you want to ask a question you could just do that oh where, where would i go uh, dave well i don't think it works for you since you're a host okay but okay. it works for everyone else okay well whatever i mean uh if, if you guys find how to raise your hand i mean uh, you could do that if not, as I said, I mean, if you if you click on number five, I mean, I will also understand. Uh, uh, this is, as I said, new, uh, and I'm not very familiar with the, with the WebEx as well. So, uh, if you uh, please be, be be patient with me. Uh, and, and then the uh, the second change that I would like to do is uh, uh, regarding the reading of, of, of Psalm. Uh, again, I would like to have. Uh, Jerry read one song, and we would do the same thing. I mean, uh, after the reading, uh, if there is any anything that can be said for the for the group's edification, or, or uh, um, as I said, I mean, the, the, what what this this reading has, has brought us uh, in in terms of understanding, or or or, or uh, as I said. Uh, uh, to increase to increase our, 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 our love and faith uh, in, in God then then uh, you're welcome as I said we'll do that the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, 
the format uh, of the service will, will stay the same for now. As I said, we can try this. And, and as I said, if this was just, just a suggestion from me, but it, it doesn't have to be, it has to have to be uh, uh, in concrete. I mean, if, if, if it doesn't work and or we, we would prefer to return to the, to the old format, then I mean, we'll do that. So, uh, with this, I would like for you to uh, please uh, rise and we'll ask uh, James to please open the service with prayer. So James, the mic is, is yours. Uh, James had to uh, leave the meeting and come back. His audio was uh, not working. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, would you would you open in, uh, the service in prayer then, uh, Dave? Uh, sure. Oh, James, James has returned now. Okay. Okay. Uh, James, if you would be uh, kind enough to to uh, open in prayer, uh, and please uh, stand up, everyone. James, can you hear me? Looks like James is still having some uh, some audio problems. Uh, okay, well, Dave, uh, <laughs> will you come to our rescue? Please? Uh, yeah, sure. If you all stand, Thanks, please. Dave. Almighty. Yehovah, we come before you during this uh, wave sheaf day, morning, to uh, thank you, Father, for what you are revealing to us through your spirit, what you are imparting to us through your spirit. Father, we do appreciate the fact that you have called us out of this world. It is a true blessing to be given insight into your way of life. We study your word and your words make sense. We look at the world events and we can slowly begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Father, you impart wisdom to your people that many others don't have. And for that, we are very thankful. Father, we know that these end time events will continue to escalate. And we know that our, our saving sacrifice, the Messiah, was accepted on this morning to sit at your right hand. And it's because of that acceptance that we've received this wonderful gift of salvation. And for that, Father, we, we, can, uh, we can only say thank you and show our gratitude through our obedience and, and love for you in keeping your laws. Father, we ask that you would continue to watch over your people around this world, that you would protect them, Father, from those that would do them harm, protect them from those that would drag them into this end time beast system that would force the mark of the beast upon them, that you would give us discernment, Father, so that we might understand what that mark of the beast is and know it when we see it and avoid it. For we know, Father, that those that are in the first resurrection don't receive the mark of the beast. And Father, none of us want to receive it, but we have to know what it is, and we look to you to give us that understanding. We study your scriptures, Father, so that we can know what your word says, and you will impart that understanding to us when we need it. Father, we thank you for the fact that even though we're quarantined and having our freedoms restrained, that we can still meet in this medium it's, uh, it's a blessing and a curse, really, this modern communications that we have, as it is used by Satan and, 
his uh, human instruments to form, mold the minds of our children and change the way that they think. And Father, we ask that you would protect our, your people and their families from those influences, that you would give them clarity of sight and understanding. And we're just grateful again, Father, for the fact that you've given us your spirit, that you are working in us to do your will. So Father, we, we ask for your presence here with us on this very significant wave sheaf morning morning when Christ ascended to your throne and and was accepted as the perfect sacrifice so father we we ask that you be with us here in spirit that you guide our thoughts and our actions that you open our minds to even greater understanding so father we just thank you we praise you and ask now for your presence here with us in the name of Yahashua the Messiah, amen. Amen to that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dave. Indeed, we are uh, living at a time where it is very important that we stay very, very close to, uh, to our Father because, as you said in your prayer, the, uh, the events will, uh, the intensity of the events at the, at the end will, uh, will increase and, and as I said, I watched the video yesterday and, and realized how uh, we are being brainwashed and, and manipulated. So uh, it is very important that we stay close to the word of Jehovah. So we'll uh, start our uh, uh, song service by singing on, the, on page uh, 72. It's called, O come and let us worship him. It's from Psalm 95 on page 72. Oh, come and let us worship him. a joyful noise indeed uh, what a great way to start our service today uh, if we uh, will turn a few pages to page 76 we'll now sing uh, our second hymn and it's called uh, sing unto you with cheerful voice and this is what we did uh, as a start but we'll continue to sing Unto Yah with cheerful voice. It's on page 75, and this is from Psalm 100.
good. You may all uh, sit now. And uh, we'll turn the mic to Wes to read in the book of a Second King, chapter 4. So over to you, Wes. I'm going to read chapter 4? Okay. That's correct, yes. Thank you. I thought I, uh, well, okay. Chapter four. The wife of, of the widow's oil. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he served the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. <clears throat> Elijah replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me what to do. What do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little pot of oil. Elijah said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few, then go inside and shut the door behind you and your son and pour oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her son. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, and she said to the son, bring me another jar. But he replied, there's not a jar left. And when the oil stopped flowing, she went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. So the Shulamite son responded, now, this is verse 8. The Shulamite's son was restored to life. <clears throat> One day, Elijah went to uh, Shuna, Shunami. Is it Nimi? You know, Niam, Shumi, Niam. And a well to do woman was there who urged him to stay <clears throat> for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who offers often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let, him, let us make a small room on the roof and put, it, put in it a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day Elijah came and he went up to his room and laid down there. He said to his servant, Gehazi, Gehazi, called the Shulamite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elijah said to him, tell her, you have gone to all the trouble for us. Now, what can I be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or command of the army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elijah said, Gehazi, Gehazi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. Then Elijah said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About, the, about time, this time, <clears throat> next year, Elijah said, you will hold a son in your arms. 
No, my lord, she rejected. <clears throat> Don't mislead your servant, O oh, oh man of God. But the woman became pregnant. And the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elijah had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he said to his father. His father told his servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on, on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants, a donkey, so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today? He asked. It's not the new moon. It's not the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. She sat on the donkey and said to her servant, lead me and don't, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she sat out and came to the man of God at Mount Gil Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant, Gehazi, look, there's the Shulamite. Run to her, meet her, and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? And is your child all right? Everything's all right, she said. And when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his hand. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. But the Lord has, has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? Elijah said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak in your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not grant, greet him. And if anyone greet you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as sure as the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on it the staff on the boy's face but there was no sound or response so Gehazi went back to meet Elijah and told him the body the boy has not awakened then Elijah reached the house there was the boy lying dead on his couch he went in shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord then he got up on the bed and laid upon the boy mouth to mouth eye to eye hand to hand as he stretched himself out upon him the boy's body grew warm Elijah turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the the bed and stretched out upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elijah summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shulamite. And he did. When she came, he said, take your son. She came in, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Death in the pot. Was it verse 38? Yeah. Elijah returned to Gilgal, and there was a 
famine in that region while the company of the prophets was meeting with him he said to his servant put on a large pot and cook some stew for these men one of them went out into the field to gather her, her herbs and found a wild vine he gathered some of it ground it, and filled the fold of his cloak then he returned he cut them into pieces of stew though no one knew what he what he knew what they were the stew was poured out for the men but as they began to eat it they cried out oh man of god there is death in the pot and they could not eat it elijah said get some flour he put it in the pot and said serve it to the people to eat and there was nothing harmful in the pot feeding of a hundred verse 42 a man came from Beth ba 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 she she all ish ha bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grains along with some heads of, of new grain give it to the people to eat Elijah said how can I set this before a hundred men his servant asked but Elijah answered give it to the people to eat for this is what the Lord says they will eat to have some left over then he set it before them and they ate and had some left over according to the words of the Lord. End of the chapter. Thank you very much, Wes. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, looks like, I mean, uh, Yeshua, the Messiah, was not the first one to multiply the food. Uh, uh, he was able to uh, feed uh, more than 100 people from, from a bit of stew here. So, uh, and uh, interesting story the story that uh of the um we read about this uh this child who uh who was born and then and then became sick and and, and then died i mean as as we uh read i mean she did not ask for a child but then it was promised to her and and after that i mean uh child died so it must have been um quite uh stress a distress for her to uh to go through all this but she kept uh she kept the faith and she went to see the man of god and um and she got her son back uh, i don't see any uh oh okay you can the mic is yours dave um, I was just going to comment on Gehazi because, you know, Elisha sent him to heal the boy and take care of the food and do all of these things, right? And he he wasn't able to do any of it because it's, it, I, I think anyway, he lacked faith. And I think that demonstrates the same thing that happened when uh, Christ sent the disciples to drive out the demons, right? The, that were uh, um, inhabiting this person and uh, they couldn't do it. And that's when he said those kind only come out through fasting and prayer. But he was constantly on them about not having the faith. And if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains, right? So it really, I think, tells the story of of making sure that you true faith is believing absolutely that God is going to do things for you uh, and and most of the time it doesn't happen because we don't truly believe it I 
I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, Dave, indeed. Uh, see, when, when, when we hear things like this, I mean, uh, sometimes we we focus on, on, on one aspect, but then we, we, we may be missing another aspect. And this is, this is the reason why I made these suggestions because uh, so you, you, you picked that up very, very well. And indeed, I mean, uh, he, he didn't have the fate, uh, enough fate to, uh, to bring the, the sudden back to life. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that indeed. And anyone else has picked up something that maybe we missed or would like to add to the, uh, for the benefit of all? Okay, we'll uh, all rise then and uh, sing our uh, next hymn. It's on uh, page 62. It's called Praise El Yehovah with a psalm. Before we read the psalm, so I thought that we would, would praise him by singing Praise El Yehovah with a psalm. It's on page 62, and this is from Psalm 81. Happen. Uh, my something happened to my screen here. Uh, where where are we? Oh, ah, Dave, I'm uh, I'm I'm lost. Uh, uh, I think oh. um, somehow you stopped sharing. I stopped sharing. How yeah. did I do that? I'm not sure. But every, oh. I think now everything that you shared before is gone. So you're going to have to oh. reshare it. Boy. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Well, I'm, uh, if you will give me a minute. Uh, uh. Uh. Sixty-two. See, uh, Wes, you're not the only one who is uh, having some problems with computers. I mean... <laughs> I pushed the button when I wanted to talk to you, and, okay. and then and then it said it said something to, to get off, and, that, and when I pushed the button to get off, I thought maybe it would put my hand down, and it just changed the screens completely. Okay. Anyway, I, as I said, I lost completely uh, everything, so uh, so now I, I downloaded the the, the hymn again. Uh, so if you would please rise, we'll sing on page sixty-two. Praise El Yehovah with a psalm, and after that, we'll ask Jerry if you could please uh, read uh, Psalm, um, that would be chapter 22. But before, let's sing Praise El Yehovah with a psalm on page 62.
Sally may all sit. Indeed, uh, our uh, father has brought us out of, of Egypt, even though our body are still in, in, in Egypt, our mind are, uh, are out of Egypt and, and uh, we're here to, uh, to be fed. Uh, to, we want to open up our mouth and, and be fed with the, with the word of God because, because we, uh, we know that they are uh, words of life. So uh, we'll now turn the mic to, um, to Jerry. Uh, and, and Jerry, if you could please read chapter 22 uh, in the book of Psalm. So over to you, Jerry. Did you hear me okay? Yes, I do. Oh, very good. Uh, Psalm 22, a Psalm of David. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season am not silent. O thou art holy, O thou that inhabited the praise of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted and thou delivered them. They cried unto thee and were delivered, they trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh at me to scorn. They shoot out the lips, they shake the head saying, he trusted on Jehovah that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, see he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me from out of the womb. Thou did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Hashem have beset me round. They gape upon me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like pot shirt and my tongue cleaveth to my jaw. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked had enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vexture. Be not thou far from me, Jehovah. O oh, my strength, hasten thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. I would declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, why praise thee? O oh, that fear Jehovah, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all you seed of Israel. For he had not despised nor hoarded the afflicted of the afflicted, neither had he hid his face from him. But when he cried out to him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise Jehovah that seeketh him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto Jehovah, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is Jehovah's, and he is a governor among the nations. All they that all they that be fed upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to Jehovah for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he had done this. That's the end of today's reading out of the King James Version of the Bible. Thank you very much, Jerry. As you read this, uh, I uh, the, the sufferings that the are uh, are Savior, our sacrifice went through to so that we could be forgiven our sins. I, do we want to continue in sin after uh, reading some of the things that you just after hearing what what you have just read? I mean the suffering that he did and, and his bones were out of joint and, and all of this. 
So uh, no, I don't think I don't think we want to continue in sin. Uh, we have to remember that uh, it is all this suffering uh, for us, so that we may be uh, washed clean and have a relationship with our Father. So uh, and today, today we're celebrating the fact that uh, his sacrifice was accepted, and uh, we can now enter God's court and and, um, and have access to our Father. And the psalm uh, continue by talking about uh, the days when uh, all the nations would come and, and, and worship worship God. So this is this is also another good news. Dave, you uh, want to say something? Um, yeah, just real quick in verse twenty-eight, <clears throat> um, the ESV says, "For kingship." belongs to Yehovah and he rules over the nations. So we see all of these nations around with their governments in place, etc. And I think we have to realize that all of those leaders of these nations, at least the way I read this, all of those rulers are put there or allowed to be there by God. And he is in control of everything that's going on here. So, so while things are progressing toward these end time events, our Father is still in control. And that's something that we have to bear in mind because, you know, these are very unsettling times. But we can take comfort in the fact that he is still in control and he, he still has a plan that he's executing. And that plan includes um, a, a, a really um, awesome, I guess, um, end for his people, right? So that reward of being in that first resurrection, I think, is, is something that uh, he's promised and he's still in control. So even though it seems like the world is out of control, I think it's still under his control. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Jerry, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say it, it's this was actually the psalm that Christ was uh, quoting just before he uh, died on the stake. And uh, it's interesting that King David actually wrote this like it was a prophecy. Like he was actually prophesizing what was going to happen to Christ in this Psalms. So I was just going to add that in there. I mean, most people knew that, but it's a fitting Psalm for actually for the day today, you know? Yeah, I think the timing was great for that, that Psalm. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, Dave, I mean, uh, God is still in control. Uh, I watched the video that you shared yesterday and uh, I at one point, I mean, uh, someone was saying that Satan is as powerful as, as God, as our father, but that's not true. Uh, he is allowed to do certain things, but uh, Yehovah is all powerful. And, and uh, I think this person will find out at one point that uh, Satan is not, is, not, uh, is not that powerful now. Yeah, I think it's interesting also that this year the wave sheaf falls on this day of Easter. It it actually lines up. It has nothing to do with the psalm. I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> Anyone else want to add something or uh we're okay? Okay, if you uh, then will uh, please all rise. We'll sing our next hymn, which is on uh, page 60. It's called, O Thou, the Shepherd of Israel Art. 
it's from Psalm 80. And again, it's on page 60. So uh, if you please all rise. good you may all be seated and indeed uh, even though we uh, are the scorn of people uh, because we of what we do and what we believe uh, we have to remember that we uh, yeah we live in the light of uh, of Yahweh's face and uh, and this is this is good reason to rejoice especially today with uh, the significance of uh, of uh, the sacrifice that was accepted on our behalf so that we may be uh, redeemed and have access to uh, to the face of Jehovah. So uh, for the mes main message today, we will uh, listen to uh, an audio it's called The Wave Sheaf uh, that was recorded by uh, by Dave in 2011, and um, at the, um, uh, I have not listened to it, but I'm pretty sure that uh, I will uh, I will get a lot of it, of this message. So um, we'll listen to this video now. Okay, welcome to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is the first day, a high day. Uh, a bit unusual, it's at the uh, first day of the feast, where the, the first day of the week can actually fall. I didn't put my mic on. Can't think and talk at the same time, so it's... Okay, good day to uh, everybody. This is the uh, Sunday or the first day of the week, and it's the first high day of, of the year, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's unusual that the that the first uh, day is is the the high day of unleavened bread. It can fall on any day during the whole seven days of the week. Of course, it can fall on the last day of the of the days of unleavened bread or any day in between. So it's occasionally it will fall on the first day. Um, the importance of this day, of course, is related to uh, food and the new food that's allowed to be eaten of the growth of the new year up until the point you have to eat the bread from the previous year. 
So until the, the sh wave sheaf is, er, is waved, or the omer as a volume or a measure of ground barley is uh, waved and offered and accepted, you cannot eat the new grain of the year wherever you are on planet Earth. So the, the fact of the matter is, if you're in the tropics and you can grow your grain year round, which we can't in the north or or in farther in the south, uh, there's a bit of a difference in administration. But the point is, you'd have to eat old and stored grain up until the omer is waved or the sheaf is waved. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to use a little bit of a study done in 19, 2007 by Will Butcher called the omer or sheaf because uh, this was a discussion that had, had come up then, was that it should only be referencing a ground grain as an omer of volume, which uh, the children of Israel in the wilderness were eating, and that's what they'd have to eat every day. On the sixth day of the week, they got a double harvest and could put it up uh, to eat the omer volume of grain, uh, ground grain on the Sabbath, because it wouldn't keep, except on a Sabbath, which was proving what day of the week the Sabbath was, because when Israel came out of Egypt, uh, they had, I think, a 10-day week. They had other versions of the calendar. So Israel didn't know, although it does indicate that Moses gave them a, a one day of the week off, which uh, Pharaoh objected to. You'll see that in, in, his eight, in, uh, in the Exodus. But so Moses was attempting to give them one day and seven off. But here the Almighty is identifying which day is the Sabbath because it's not in Scripture. It doesn't define how you can determine on your own the, uh, what day is the seventh day of the week is. So if you're on a drop in a desert island with a really good Bible, you still won't. And you don't know what day of the week it is because you know, your ship sunk or something. Uh, you won't be able to discern it from Scripture, which, which would seem odd to us as a salvation event and a requirement. But here you see God intervenes, and he lets them know what day the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath is, by having no manna appear on the seventh day and getting twice as much on the sixth day. So they would have food to eat on the Sabbath, and that identified the Sabbath. So this day is, is of tremendous significance, we are keeping it then at the third hour in North America. Uh, we're using the third hour uh, for local time as a, a means of uniformity of worship around the planet uh, because the further north you go, uh, the closer you are to the equinox, the closer you are to the third hour from uh, the rising of the sun, so, so light shining you'll be fairly close the closer you are to the equinox and you'll be even closer on the equator. But as the weeks then stretch out, the third hour can be m improperly identified because in the dead of winter in the northern hemisphere, December or the June, the summer, winter and summer solstice, the, the length of hours are reversed and it wouldn't, there isn't close to the, the ninth hour. So we're, we're making this as a matter of the determination. Of course, anybody who is attempting to determine the number of hours closest to the 9 a.m., here it's overcast and pouring rain, so you wouldn't have been able to anyway. So uh, sometimes you have to be a bit careful about making that type of assertion or judgment on the matter, because if it's raining, uh, it doesn't matter. Now, in, in the modern Israel, of course, should really be called Judea because there are very few Israelites there. They're all in the northwest Europe. And um, but anyway, they uh, start their day with um, postponing high days so you don't have back-to-back -back Sabbaths, etc. And interestingly, though, um, people that come amongst us as that we would term generally covenant-keeping Christians often have other, other ideas because they say that the, the high day must be on a full moon. And 80, 85% of the time, the first day of unleavened bread is a full moon. But 
16, 18, I forget the percentage now, I haven't thought about this for a while, the full moon is on the 16th and less so on the 14th, at the end of the 14th, closer to, to dark. So no, it does not have to be a full moon. It has to be the 15th day of the first month like the Almighty told us to do. And so we, ha we have to be a bit careful about adding uh, our general uh, impressions about this, uh, this uh, time period. So here we are in the 15th day. The full moon actually is uh, six hours later. It's on the 16th of Jerusalem time and very close to North American time. But we don't worship according to North American or any other time. We worship according to the time zone set by Jerusalem. That's the day that's kept holy. So this is the 15th day, not postponed, and it's not a full moon. And then the Samaritans introduced, of course, this was termed the sin of Jeroboam, and the whole calendar was offset by a month. So there are groups that keep the uh, first month of the year uh, following the, the equinox, uh, and they keep it according to the conjunction, but they're, they're a month late every year. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different views on this, uh, how you would determine this day, uh, because we'll read some of the scriptures here, but I'll, I just want to, as a beginning here, to cover this discussion about whether we're talking about an omer of green, grain offered as, as, as the uh, first harvest, or we're talking about waving a sheaf of barley, which may be two or three feet high, it can be brown, ready for harvest, or it can be green. And you can have a, a two or three difference in the, in the time of the grain harvest in the Middle East by the weather and by how close to the conjunction the months fall. So the, any day of the week, like the 15th day of the first month, can move by several weeks each year, and the weather can change and modify the growth of the crops by several weeks each year. So if you're going to start your year by the growth of barley outside of Jerusalem, uh, you may be changing, uh, you're changing the months, and, but you're then changing the feasts and the holy days of God for everybody on planet Earth. Because the growth of the barley isn't, isn't just there so that people that live around Jerusalem can be righteous and keep the correct day. The days have to be published. Now, the Samaritans publish a calendar twice a year based on the conjunction, and if you don't obtain it from the Samaritan priesthood, uh, you're, you're a persona non grata at the at non grisma and at their face. So it's, it's amazing how most parts of society have bits and pieces of the truth and mixed in with a little bit of air that can put them off, and God has not laid out very clearly in Scripture uh, the start of the day, the start of the year, and the start of the month, and the cycle. Uh, because he certainly could have if he wanted to. So there appears to be some reason why he does not want most people understanding this and able to come up to a, to a fairly simple judgment on the matter and are misled by various people in some type of authority. But anyway, this is the day of the wave sheaf or omer offer. So, uh, he, Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, 6016, is 14 times in the Old Testament. It's untranslated as Omer, six times in Exodus 16. And the other eight times, eight times it is translated as sheaf or sheaves. And uh, one was a measurement, the other is a description of a sheaf of barley, which was the, the grain they were harvesting. First you had the barley harvest near Jerusalem, or in, in Judea, then you had the wheat harvest in June, and then you had the variety of fruit and other harvests in the fall. So there was three different harvests of uh, grains and fruits, etc., over the three feast periods. So should we be calling this the wave sheaf offering and uh, querying how it was uh, the, the service was held, or are we talking about an omen, a measurement of, of a ground, finely ground bark? And if, is there a difference, and what difference does it make? Now you can see Exodus 16. <clears throat> you can read it uh, on your own. But uh, verse 16, the thing which Jehovah had commanded gathered to every man according to his eating an omer, 
everyone, uh, for every man according to the number of your persons, take uh, every man of them which are in their tents. The children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less. So here they're gathering some more and some less of the amount of the manna, which had to be collected up before the sun came up when it was still twilight because when the heat hit them, maggots would get on them and they'd be unable to be eaten. So it had to be taken at twilight before the heat, or at least before the heat of the sun got on them and the maggots and things would appear. So, but every man would gather according to his eating and there should be enough for each one. So here you see you have a bit of a, an English description of a Hebrew text, and sometimes it can be a bit difficult to uh, gather it. But um, some of the observations of this are that um, the people would be gathering it, piling it into a heap, and then each took another measures of an omer of this grain. But you see, now they're taking seeds. So here you have an omer of seeds which is very different than an omer of finely ground barley, which would have three or four times the food content and value that the seeds have. Here, though, they're talking about manna. So when you're putting manna, which was like, I think it's akin to, it's called coriander seed, or there's some other representations, but it may be we don't know the texture of it correctly. So we just know whatever would fit into a, close to a one quart jar level to the top was enough to feed uh, people during the, for one full day. So there's a bit of a disparity on are we talking about gathering seeds? Are we gathering of, of the barley harvest? Are we talking about gathering, measuring the seeds ground? Because it's a, this then relates to Pentecost and relates to the elect. What I'm just starting off with here. That's where this goes as a matter of the of the priesthood of Melchizedek and the elect. So that's why I just wanted to cover this to start with so you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about a bit later. But uh, you can take it a number of different ways, but this was more so you understand the, the queries on this. So are we talking about an omer, a volume of grain? Or are we talking about a sheep being waved? Well, if the barley wasn't ripe, you would have to be waving it in a green ear. I don't see the, the, the reason for the dispute about this or understanding or making too big of a deal. Well, if the, if the fields are white with harvest because there was good heavy rains over the winter, then it dried up very cleanly in the summer, the sun was on it, the harvest would come to life weeks earlier, and you would have grain ready for the harvest before the 15th day of the first month. So you could have grain heads on the seed. Part of it, though, they, they would take the not quite ripened and parch it, which then made it so you could digest it. You're not eating green, you know, eating the green uh, grains before they're ready. Or it could be white, ready for harvest, and then ground up and put into a container. So you'd get a lot more nutritional content of food than a, than a container full of seeds if you had a, fa a container full of finely ground grains that were filtered. So just so you understand that's the, the difference, but I mean, generally you understand it would relate to the year. And if the year was a few weeks early, which it, it will rotate between one whole month when you have an added month and this type of thing, and weather conditions every year, they're different every year. I think this year, in, uh, around Jerusalem, they postponed it <clears throat> because the wild or the the omer that was planted specifically for the purpose of having it be ready for to be harvested early was late. So, in spite, in spite of us plotting, you know, or planting barley to have it appear available to be picked at a time of the year we would like to keep the days of unleavened bread. No, it's a month later because it didn't come up. Weather conditions, time of the cycle, right? Because you got a month either way, from year to year. So, I mean, this is just, I don't know if you've been involved in any of these the types of comments, because most people just would like us not to be keeping it. Because very few people on planet Earth keep this thing. And that's the main point of, the, of this. Uh, it's presented as a query, but really it's just a, 
uh, you know, you can't know what the right thing is to do, so don't bother. Well, no, we know what the right thing is to do. Jesus Christ is the wave chief that was offered and was accepted on the 14th day. He was in the grave. And on that end of that Sabbath, which in A.D. 30 was a, was a Wednesday of the sacrifice, he came, was resurrected at the end of the Sabbath. Then the next morning, of course, is the day of the wave offering, the first day of the week in the middle of the days of unleavened bread at the time of the year of Christ's sacrifice in A.D. 30. And that's verifiable by, by uh, the astro astronomical measurements of, of the new moons. So on that day, you see, uh, he was then resurrected at the end of the Sabbath, exactly 70, or 36, uh, then to 72 for three complete days. So he had to be dead for three complete days. He's di he died at the ninth hour, which we would generally determine to be hour three in the afternoon. And from that time, when you got a, you look at a, a clock, or you hold up a clock, and uh, to the when the sun is at three in the afternoon, you'll see if you're facing north or facing south, you'll see that the sun at three o'clock is what you would call three-quarter position in the sky. Now, anciently, they would say, when it dropped below that, here's the horizon, when it dropped below that, that that's the going down of the sun. Over that whole three-hour three period, right, between three and six, today, going down of the sun to us means going below the horizon. So you immediately have a conflict between the way people use words 2,000 years ago and how we do today. So that's why you have to do a bit of study and just get an understanding of what was going on anciently first and then apply it to what we're doing today. Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind as we continue on here because uh, this is a, it's a pretty good study. He's got a lot of uh, good information on it. But uh, um, the sheaf and the action of binding was even... Uh, when Joshua went in the promised land, they would, they would tie up the sheaths of grain. So as the barley was getting up, they may have to go down into southern Judea to find barley getting up to a height. They then would tie those sheaths off, and then um, before the, uh, the morning, early, so they'd be out at dark, they would cut the sheaths and take the whole sheaths wrapped, usually three bundles full, to offer them to the high priest at Jerusalem. And he would either accept them or reject them. Uh, if they were accepted, they were then uh, winnowed, or the grains were taken out, crushed, and then put through a mill and put into a normal container, because that is the first of the first fruits of the grain offering that can be eaten of the year. So the lamb was sacrificed on the 14th that gave protection to the nation of Israel. So that lamb, ram lamb, was sacrificed for the protection of the, all the nation of Israel. Then the wave offering was done then three days later, and Jesus Christ went from the, his grave site to his Father in heaven, and then returned later before he went uh, to his father as the acceptable sacrifice, uh, Miriam had come near the, near the tomb and, and she went to touch, it, touch him and grab his feet. And he said, don't do that, don't touch me. Uh, and it's not generally understood. But he couldn't be touched by any human being at his resurrection before he was accepted by his father. He had to go completely unpolluted or, or clean, as, a, as the terminology might be, untarnished by the world at large. So no one was allowed to touch him, because a bit later, when he, when he came back, Thomas put his finger in his side, in the hole in his side. He showed him he's touching his injuries, right? So there wasn't a problem touching him after he was accepted as the sacrifice of the way she offering, because he had to fulfill all the offerings. The sin offering, the jealousy offering, every, every offering that is in the list and the litany for the Old Testament temporary sacrificial system, he fulfilled 100% of it, including the jealousy offering. 
Why? Because Yehovah is jealous. He wants you and your worship as his uh, children, and he doesn't want to give it to the state to be his God and father, to be your God and father. But anyway, uh, we'll just uh, continue just covering some of the highlights here without necessarily getting into detail. We can cover detail this afternoon if there's too many questions. But it's... Um, Here's a comment by Jeff Benner. I think we all know him, who is a, is a good uh, student of Old Testament Hebrew as much as New Testament Hebrew, because they're quite a different language. Old, old Hebrew is not modern Hebrew. And anybody speaking Old Hebrew uh, isn't understood by modern Hebrew speakers. So to understand that, right, the, there's, there's a bit of a difficulty with some of this. But here was uh, Mr. Benner's uh, comments on this. And originally, the word may have meant sheaf, the, the term omer. And a sheaf produced a grain of, uh, um, an omer, a, a quart of seeds, right? Because then that doesn't quite fit with, a, with a, a quart of ground, finely ground, milled barley. They don't equate in volume of food. But that was his assumption, was uh, he believed that as a, a good, rich stock of a grain of barley would fill close to a quart of seeds in the barley. But he's unsure, and, and uh, we haven't been able to find anything to verify or validate this, so we have um, to make our own determination of it, because the point is, well, whether you're waving an omer of ground grain as an omer, as an offering, as a wave sheaf, same as you offer that's why we often try to get a right front shoulder of a lamb to cook on the, on the Passover meal because that is to be given to the priest of Melchizedek, of the order of Melchizedek, as an offering, right? The right front shoulder. Um, so, I mean, there's reasons we're doing certain things. Not necessarily that we, we have to know what was done 3,000 years ago as the Almighty is dealing with his, uh, his uh, first fruits of, uh, of the nation of Israel. And, and his firstborn that he has to redeem. So uh, just keep that in mind. So you're, you're talking about two things here. Generally, I would, I would assert that if it's green, you wave the, sh the sheaf because they're green. And you, you have to parch it. I mean, you have to do some real work with the grain to dry it so it's palatable enough to eat. So it's not like, well, maybe they would have had time, and, uh, but not by the third hour when the sheaf had to be offered. You know, from the, from the time the sun comes up and you're cutting it and bringing it in, I'm not sure that you could parch it that quickly and then, then uh, put it into a, an a omer vessel and wave it. But maybe they had a way to do it. But we'll cover what, what Joshua did when he came into the promised land. Because after they ate the harvest of the land, after it was waved at the wave sheaf offering, omer, the, the manna stopped. So as soon as they were eating the new grain of the new year in the promised land on the other side of the Jordan, manna stopped bang. So they uh, uh, continued on with that for year to year with making this uh, wave sheaf offering according to scripture of, of uh, not eating it. They could, if it was dried and falling off the head, well, they could pick it up and store it, but not eat it until the wave sheaf, until the... First day of the week within the days of unleavened bread, which this year is the, happens to coincide with the first day. Um, let's see. Um, sometimes uh, symbolic representations were made about beating and winnowing the grain. You know, and Christ as a wave sheaf offering was was beaten to where he was almost unrecognizable. So there's a variety of symbolism that can be presented in this, um, but. Um, uh, the translations, some of them are quite good and some of them are, are less so. Verse, uh, the first fruits of Leviticus 23.10, uh, uh, a sheaf of your first fruits of your harvest. The word first fruits has the meaning of beginnings and the entomological family tree of the parent root, which has a concrete meaning of head. So it was the, the, the first of the first fruits of the harvest which is generally taken to be somewhere around between two and three percent, which had to be given to the priest. You couldn't eat it. So the first fruits of the harvest went to the priest. 
You're not allowed to eat it. It's not just not your harvest. It's uh, God's harvest, and He gives that percentage to the priests and to then subsequently to the Levites as well. But that's what this is talking about when you're talking about first fruits, because you can often have part of a harvest, whether it's a grain or fruit, can be ripe and ready to be picked, where 80, 90 percent of it needs another week or 10 days of good hot sunshine to be ripe and suitably enough to dry and store or, or to eat. So the whole harvest cycle has to be reasonably well understood to get the point of sometimes what's being talked about here. But either way, a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest, beginnings or head. Um, uh, there's, a di there's not much contention over this in the different lexicons, etc. Uh, verse 17, uh, the word first fruits is 1016, uh, is first fruits as opposed to being called uh, the head or the beginning as the first fruits. So I just, you know, sometimes there's a problem with our English translations and misunderstanding of ancient Hebrew, but we all know that. But anyway, from our point of view, uh, is this, right? Uh, the beginning offering were not burned on the altar, right? Uh, Leviticus 2, 11 to 16, no meat offering which you shall bring unto Jehovah shall be made with leaven. So here you can see in the translation, they're talking about meat, meaning grain, food, which in Middle English in the 14 and 1500s, uh, meant grain as well. Well, you know, this is our meat, our, our food. doesn't mean a steak as it does to us today. Uh, you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in an offering of Jehovah made by fire. This is the oblation. As the oblation of the first fruits, you shall offer them unto the Lord. Um, they shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet savor. So for whatever the reason was, these were not to be burned. I would generally understand historically that they were given to the priests to be their food as the first of the first fruits, right? Or the first fruits of the harvest, two to three percent, that was given to the priests. But then here we have, uh, has to be seasoned with salt, um, etc. So there's a bit of a disparity between the, the true first fruits and the beginning of the harvest in English. I would generally take it that they're talking about the same thing, that the first up to 5% is ripe and ready for harvesting first, which is what is taken by the first fruits, first fruits of the trees, etc. But that is not harvested for the, the person of the land who grew it. That's get, that first fruit is given straight to the priests probably because they're running out of food, right? Because they're living on food that was provided at the three feasts and the stored food that kept them through the six month winter period. So at this springtime now, they're running out of, probably running out of stored, calling it an offering, but it wasn't an offering. It was, a, it was a, a tax that had to be paid to keep the ministry of religion uh, open because they were also the high judiciary. They were your, the national high court in Israel, right? And the Levites were the lower courts, the administrators for the nations. They are compared to our modern bureaucracy in the running of the nation. The priests ran the temple and also were the, high, the Supreme Court. And that's how it was administered in those days. So uh, what you might wonder, well, what difference does it make from our point of view? We're talking about Jesus Christ as the first of the first fruits because there's some individuals consider the, the church of God of the last 2,000 years uh, the first fruits because um, of the grain harvest, of the seeds, so that you've got individual seeds, therefore you'd have to have individual members as if only one seed off of one sheaf was offered uh, as Messiah, right? So they got one little grain there. Oh, he's the first of the first fruits, but a whole jar of, of Omer and seeds, well, that's the church of God of the last thousand years. See, I mean, some of the assertions made by supposed symbolism can, would sound preposterous to us today. But, you know, 50-odd years ago, they, they, they were swallowed whole. 
No. We were the sacrifice that was accepted from Pentecost. After the receipt of the Holy Spirit, then we received the opportunity to be part of the harvest. We're not part of the first of the first fruit offering. The first fruits were the, those were waived and given to Jehovah. He said, you will give my tenth to the Levites and to the Cohens. And they, the Cohens get a bit more. They get the first of the first fruits of every harvest. So whether it's your fall feast harvest, you take off the first fruits and you send them to the Cohens. That's the law. Because it's, a, it's an administrative requirement for a national body. A natural, national bureaucracy is what we're talking about. Not just running a temple over there. It's the whole national system. That, and that's what we're going to be living with identically in, uh, in the millennial period. So I just want to bring up a few of these points in case you're asked about them and you hadn't ever heard them before. Because this most specifically relates to the today. We started here at the third hour in our local time in, in eastern North America. Uh, but um, not necessarily a third hour according to the, the clock. But you wouldn't have been able to determine it according to the natural cycle because it's pouring rain and overcast here. So you wouldn't know them anyway. So we're doing the very best we can with, with what we have to work with. Okay. Um, Numbers 21.5, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and water, and we hate this useless food manna. Oh, there's no grumblers in the Israelite community. Imagine, you're taking out of slavery that all you did was complain to your slavery. I mean, they wanted to go back into their slavery. They're happier because you got better food. Now, they're all perfectly healthy. Their shoes and clothes haven't worn out in decades. And, but here's their comment about, about that, right? So it was a witness about the, the, the seventh-day Sabbath for openers, and they kept them perfectly healthy. But you can see the, what a comment to make, huh? Okay, um, John 6, 28 to 31, they said to him, what must we do? Uh, be doing the works of God Jesus answered them this is the work of God that you believe him who he has sent and they said uh, well what sign are you going to do that we can see you do so and then we'll believe you what work do you perform our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat so Christ corrects them typically they're misquoting scripture what else is now he corrected them to say no no We'll continue on here, John 6, 32 and 33. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, it wasn't Moses that gave you the food to eat. Oh, these guys had nothing else to do but read the Old Testament. No, no, you're misrepresenting what Scripture said. So nothing's changed under the sun. It wasn't Moses that gave you the bread, but God Almighty gives you the true bread from heaven. Now the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. So, uh, just you can see when, when if people are querying you on why you're doing what you're doing, uh, it's, it's helpful to have a scriptural re response into it without getting into a, a, a needless public debate over it. The debates really should be in writing. So then a person has to stand by his words. And that's what will judge them. You're judged by your words. So if you're not worried about it, put it in writing and instead of just uh, making verbal complaints and declaration. Hey, look how foolish these, these people look who are, who are accosting Jesus Christ. Ah, Moses didn't give it to you. The Almighty, God Almighty fed you. And he, he's continuing on here, John 6, 34 to 40. The Lord, give us this bread always. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Uh, but I say to you, you have seen me and still you don't believe. All that the Father gives me will I will come to me, and him who comes to me I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son believes in him should have life inherent, eternal life, and I will resurrect him at the last day. 
So that's quite a, an astonishing statement. You know, you, you also have him declaring that uh, you'll have to eat his body and drink his blood. And so most of the people that were, were attending to his services and following him left uh, because they could readily quote scripture to show that, that uh, you're not allowed to drink any blood of anybody and, uh, and sh certainly shouldn't be eating people. But you see, they, they didn't wait for an explanation. They just bolted, assuming they knew what was being said. So we have to be a bit cautious with this type of thing. So when we first start keeping this, this wave sheaf offering on the first day of the week of unleavened bread, it may seem a bit unusual. Uh, a lot of our services are held sometimes a bit later. But uh, we're generally covering the time of the, of the afternoon sacrifice and close to the time of the morning sacrifice, which was the intent. But the sacrifice has been made and accepted. But it's the sacrifice in all of its aspects. So it was an offering for the sin sacrifice, as well as here now we're having the jealousy and wave sheaf offering for, as a jealousy offering. So, but all of the offerings, we probably should put a list of all of them on a, on a short paper. And, and the, the scriptures that show that Christ fulfilled every single aspect of this, this temporary legislation that was put in place in Jeremiah 7, 20, you can see it, uh, to keep Israel alive. So that's the intent of it. So we should do our very best to fulfill the principles involved, even though we don't kill anything, because the sacrifice has been once made once for all of his creation to redeem it. Okay. Um, Messiah is called the bread of life from John 6.34, and he is the wave sheaf offering of Leviticus 23.10. Okay, now in, in this uh, sort of modern time, we have uh, uh, people living in modern day Jerusalem or around Jerusalem called Israel, but they're actually not Israelites. And uh, there are remarkable people there called the Karaites or, or biblical scripturalists. They take the Old Testament and administer it according to the letter of the law, taking it absolutely as a requirement to do. And they're, they're not well viewed by, by uh, the orthodoxy amongst the Judaism who keep the oral law. And, uh, but there's, a, there's an interesting quote here I just want to read and see. In the days of Rehoboam, Israel split into the southern and northern kingdom. The Judeans of the southern kingdom were Zadok, Zadokim, meaning we're pronouncing it Sadducees, but those are all the descendants of the man Zadok as a priest in Israel. So that's who the Sadducees were. They were the, the national priests in Israel. The Hasmoneans, Maccabees, and Karaites. Um, but the Judeans of the, of the southern kingdom keep the law of God as it is written, and that those are the Zad, termed the Zadokites or the Sadducees. Um, he gives themselves a bit of credit here. But he's isolating these, these ancient individuals. I don't have his historical information here, but that's who he believes is what we're calling Sadducees were the, the priests of Zadok who were the ones that were responsible for the temple and who kept the, the exact same calendar sequence, including the wave sheaf offering and a Sunday Pentecost that we do, identical. The, the, the individuals showing the oral law or the, you know, the, the mahasim of these uh, individuals, oral traditionalists, caused actually, as Christ explains in, in, I guess in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, he, he's just condemning them for using the oral law to override scripture. He said, you can't do it. So uh, just time, sometimes when these words come to, come to your forehead, so you have a bit of the background of them. So the Sadducees had some problems in their understanding, but they had the calendar sequence correct. And um, and they kept the, the day of Pentecost on the Sunday, 50 days after today. 
So today begins to count the first day of the week within unleavened bread. You go 50 days and you'll be on the first day of the week in May or June, depending on when it falls in the, in the annual cycle. Uh, the, the Pharisees uh, changed it to sit on six because they said you don't start to count from the Sabbath, you start to count from the first high day. So they start their count from today, which has to end up then every year on seven six. So you don't need to count, for, go from week to week to week, right? Seven, seven sevens of 49, and then the next day being the first day of the week. You don't have to make sure you don't lose a week there. It doesn't matter because if you're seven and six, it, it, it doesn't change any year. Where for us, every year is different. The, the first day is very unusual, falling on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Usually it's one of the other days and can be on the last day. And then you would start your count from the first day of the week. If it fell on the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that then is your count to the 50-day day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost, if you weren't there at the third hour, uh, maybe you wouldn't receive the Spirit of God as a gift. So you, you do have to be clear on, on how days are being picked and selected. And when people can test it, well, who are they? The rabbinical, well, uh, uh, you would call them Talmudists today, who put together the, the, the Mishnah and all the Talmud studies, are against the plan of God and against God and make themselves God. And even claim that God has to read the Talmud to study what they say. Yes, so there's some presumption in our human nature that is aghast. Should make you aghast if you believe there's a creator God. Why he puts up with us, I don't know, but he does. And we're his firstborn, he's going to redeem us, and we should end up like him. Right? When we find out how it was going to work, I know how much wealth and health you're going to have down the road, how well your family's going to do, you should be thrilled to death. Why we complain about all oh, this horrible manna. Imagine, <laughs> you feed your kids for 40 years and, and they're healthy and in perfect condition. Ah, we ate this manna. We want to go back into slavery where we can eat leeks and onions, even better, and probably garlic. That's, I mean, that's just, we are judged by our words, though. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. You know, these guys, they're going to close to cursing the Almighty who's taking care of them. The only reason he took care of them for the 40 years is because he was going to kill them. All they had to do was go into the promised land and walk on it and claim it. And he would have driven all the Canaanites out of there with uh, hornets. And that'll work. They didn't, the Israelites didn't have to lose one person taking over the promised land. They would have, could have just walked in, claimed it, put their footprints around the territories they were going to take, which was given to them by Lot from Jehovah, and the Canaanites would have been killed or driven out by harness. So all of the, everything would have remained there for them to use and just take over. No, 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 we want a war. So when they first approach it, I forget what, what commander it was, that sent in all these troops to start a fight and have, have a war after God said just to go in. Didn't say fight your way in. He said, okay, well, if you like war, then you'll have it. So you have to be careful when you're praying. You might get what, that's what they wanted. They're going to go and take care of these uh, troublesome people that aren't allowed in their promised land. Well, that isn't what he said to do, but then that's what they had to do. So all the young men and boys and people that were died and massacred over the years, none of them had to be. We demanded it. And so your father said, fine, I'll work around it and I'll, you know, I'll do take care of things anyway, but that's what you want. You got it. So be careful when you're asking for something. Make sure you're thinking long term. Ask God first. You know, we can't ask for signs <clears throat> because you, you saw how strongly that was dealt with. But anyway, uh, it's not an unreasonable assumption to make this service at the third hour, our 9 a.m. Um, and the others then did keep it. Even the, the first church was, was uh, keeping a, a Sunday. And... Um, uh, the Roman Catholic group that took over in the third, third and fourth century th from 325, they still had a Sunday Pentecost in those days and a correct calendar. Occasionally, our calendar is online. It may have even been last year when, when, when the first day of Pentecost was, or first day of, um, of unleavened bread was, was a, uh, 
was it, a, it was an Easter Sunday or the Easter Sunday may have been the last day of the feast, I forget now. But occasionally they do link up. Now, I assume, for the most part, they don't allow it to link up with rabbinic Judaism's calendar. They're always a week or two out of sync with it, mm -hmm. unless the rabbinic Jews are a month late themselves. Well, then they would line up with us because they keep the old measurement of how to start the year. The 15th day after the equinox is, this, is that month is the start of the year, which is why occasionally the Roman Catholic Church of Easter Sunday and Pentecost align with us. But for the most part, they're a week or two out of sync to keep them out of sync with rabbinic Judaism. But that's why they're doing what they're doing. But they, you can see they know perfectly well what they're doing. Or otherwise, they wouldn't make those determinations, calendrical determinations. You, know, you, have, you can't just hope for the best or throw a dart at a thing and do this. You actually have to know what you're talking about. And so they're intentionally making sure that no one can worship Jehovah on the correct day, except they're assuming that these modern Jews have the authority. <coughs> Christ removed the authority and put it onto the priesthood of Melchizedek when he sent his disciples out two by two. And they drove out the demons and the, the, uh, some, the sons of the priests couldn't. You see, from the point Messiah sent those after his resurrection, and he returned of the way sheaf offering acceptable, he gave authority to his people. The Spirit of God was on them. They could go out and they could throw demons and the sons of the high priest, not just any old priest, the high priest, couldn't, couldn't throw them out. Because the priesthood is removed and given to the order of Melchizedek, with the Gentiles being added to it, not by uh, heritage, not by genetic inheritance, right? Not by heritage, but by God's appointment, because he's appointed all the Gentile nations will be attached to one tribe of Israel or other. Some of the individuals from these Gentile nations will be made Levites. You will be Levites to me, he said. So they will perform the functions of Levi in China or Japan or whatever nation that they're appointed to. But as you can see, uh, there's a lot more to the story than, than is generally presented or taken up. I mean, there's a lot going on in this morning sacrifice. You know, man, oh man. Okay. Um, Leviticus 23, 9 to 14, Jehovah said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, when you come into the land, I give you to reap his harvest. You shall bring the sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheep before Jehovah that you may find acceptance. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So here's a contentious issue with, with rabbinic Judaism. They're claiming that's not the seventh day of the week, Shabbat. They're claiming it's the high day, Shabbat on. Right. It's a different word. No, no, that's the seventh day of the week. So yesterday was the Sabbath. Today, Jesus Christ is, was to have been waived, right? But you see, as the week doesn't fit in the, lo in the lunar month, you've got four weeks or 28 days. The month is 29.53. They can never align up correctly every year. There's always going to be a day's movement. So as the day moves through the days of unleavened bread, it, the first day of the week can fall on any of the seven days of unleavened bread in, in every year that changes, which of course is, is objectionable too because then you can't sort of publish a calendar that everybody can more readily follow. Well, then you know who to complain to. But that's the, what you're to do. On the morning after the seventh day of the week, the priest shall wave it. On the day you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, year old with ble without blemish, as a holocaust to Jehovah. And the cereal offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil offered by fire to Jehovah, a pleasing odor. And the drink offering with it shall be wine. You shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this day. So what they're meaning is you can't eat, even if the harvest was ripe a week or two earlier, and you're running low on food, you can't eat that grain of that New Year's harvest because it's only just coming up to the new year. We're only 14 days into the new year, right? So it's still last year's, right? And I know people did go and cut it and claim it was from last year's and they ate it anyway, but that isn't what it says. You plant your harvest, barley I think is, is 60 or 80 days. I, I, I can't remember what the primitive grains of barley. It's awkward to compare the growth of modern grains of barley 
to what was growing two and three thousand years ago, these primitive grains, didn't have as much harvest but could su survive almost anything. We have a higher grain harvest per head, but it can't survive too cold, too hot, too dry, too this, it, and then you wilts and goes, right? Where the primitive stuff could survive almost anything, but it still was contingent on the weather as to whether before this first day in unleavened bread, it was ripe with grain that you could grind and put in an omer, or you took the green ears, as the terminology is, and you waved the whole sheaf as an offering, because it's a jealousy offering. But you can't eat that food of that harvest. Now, we would generally assert that this is now talking about the spiritual food of the temple of God uh, that we received during this feast. And so from this day now, if you've had something that's plaguing you, uh, maybe do a, a, a Bible study on it here and see if you get any new food or new nourishment from a study over something that may have been plaguing you for years. This is the time to do it because from now, from this day forward, you should be able to digest and receive new spiritual food and have new better understanding. And it should happen year to year, a better improvement. Now, that's an assertion. Doesn't say that anywhere. Oh, well, you know, then you. That's what I take out of it from uh, just watching what was happening over, over this last 16, 18 years. So uh, you can uh, put that to the test if you would like. But sometimes things just, uh, you can't get certain things out of your head, right? They just, you know, it's unresolved. You think it this way or you think it that way. If you're thinking about half a dozen different ways, you might as well just give up because you better settle, better settle your own mind down a bit right now. It's, it's either going to be this or that. It can't be all of it. So uh, you have to isolate your problem in your own mind, and then uh, we can do a study on it and hope, hope for the best. Hopefully we, we do know what we're talking about because we need correction from time to time. Uh, there's not much I can see we're doing wrong, most certainly over the calendar because this has been astonishing the people that come in with you know no you can only do this on the full moon so that would mean well then you can only do it tomorrow because the first day of unleavened bread has to be on a full moon oh no it doesn't it has to be on the 15th day of the first month that's what it says it's usually a full moon but that's adding into scripture right you're adding into it which which can't work astronomically same with the crescent moon if you don't know when the crescent is, how does everybody on planet Earth keep the correct days? Whether it's the first month or the seventh. If it's determined by a crescent in Jerusalem, how does everybody else on planet Earth know, here's the day of trumpets, here's where your preparation is, here's when you have to keep the day of atonement. And if you don't keep the day of atonement on the correct day, you're emasculated from Israel. Everything's cut off. You're not just castrated, you're everything gone. That's what the word means, you're cut out of Israel. Oh, it doesn't matter. We'll, we have to postpone the days, and we'll, you know, we'll, we don't really know when the when the conjunction can be seen. And how would they? So, because that's when the discussion with even with the Karaites, who have my deepest respect, was they, then all oh, you're making yourself salvageable, and all your brethren all over the world don't know, do they? Well, now they know because you got the internet, or you can phone them. Well, what have you done for the past two thousand years? I said, you know, come on, guys. You, you actually have to use a little bit of common sense. God doesn't make it impossible. Make it something impossible to do and then kill you because you couldn't do it. Hmm. We don't worship a God like that. You know, like your children, you know, you're not doing that algebra properly when they're four years old. You know, you know, our Father, if anything, is, is, is too lenient on us. He lets us get away with a bit too much. But when he acts, it's usually pretty severe. Seems to be all or nothing, right? So he's warning, 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 then be careful. We've got to be careful. And people have died. Right? I only know of two, but, uh, but that was perfectly obvious what was going on. So anyway, we'll continue on here. So new bread eaten. So we can go to Joshua 5 here, I think. So we eat... Um, nor green, parched, nor fresh, nor a ground. Uh, a ground. So let's see, Joshua 5, 11 or 10, I think. 
Yeah, well, all the people of Israel were encamped in Gilgal. They kept Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho on the day after Passover. On that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes, parched grain. So here you're into warming the grains, parching it so it would be uh, digestible because they weren't quite ripe. They're close to ripe if you get the point here. So that's why they're parching it. It's not quite ripe for the harvest, but it's if you parch it, you can, di you're, you can digest it. So it's suitable. There was no longer manna for the people of Israel. They ate the fruit of the land in Canaan that year. So from, from the day they're able, from this day you're able to eat the, the harvest of the land that surrounds us. Up until this point, you should be eating only stored grains or old, or old grains. So most of us don't plant grains or harvest that type of thing, but you will, that's what you will have to do in the future if you start planting a barley harvest. So you have grain for, that you don't have to buy. If things down the road maybe turn a bit nasty and you have to grow a lot of your own food, well, then put it in and uh, you'll have to wait till this day to eat the, the new grain of your new year. And uh, you're not to eat it in the past. But here, you know, this is an interesting point. When uh, Joshua was taking them in, Moses died. Was, his body was hidden, or to be a, be a place of pilgrimage, I guess, or his bones would have been spread all over planet Earth, like certain other individuals' bones are, in, in, uh, in uh, various Jew Jewish as well as Muslim uh, theaters, I guess is a better word for it. I mean, a mausoleum of some description, but really it's just a show of a bone claimed to be John the Baptist is, is in, a, in a Muslim museum or, or a Muslim place. And so that, that's what we do. So that's why God put Moses where he wouldn't be found, right? Because there would have been, his bones would have been scattered all over planet Earth. Probably could have rebuilt about a dozen people the way they usually do their bones. And every Catholic church on the planet is built on the bones of someone dead. And that's why they have the graveyard attached to it because they, you can't have a church except it's on the de dead. But amongst the Protestants as well, they, they've then followed into the same line of thinking and or retained it when they tried to reform or come out of Catholicism. They all have, although they're not buried on the bones of the dead, which every cathedral is, they bury their dead uh, on the field next door, right? So they're attached, but they're kind of a little bit at arm's length. But the whole building is centered on the dead. What's God's building centered on? Living stones in a living temple. Living life, not the dead. Because one of the prime false worship or aspects of false worship is ancestor worship. It was throughout the East. It is also throughout the West. That's why you pray. Catholics pray to dead saints. They're praying to their ancestors, the dead, that they want the dead to take care of their problems. Uh, never mind asking God to, because it, when you're going to have a relationship with God, you made a contract with them from your baptism. Here's your part of the contract. Make sure you're abiding by it, or don't complain if things aren't working right. So we made everything in this is relate is contractually based. But this worship of the dead is a huge problem in in idolatrous worship in general, and that's part of what's being discussed here. Okay, um, Joshua is a good reference to it, that the old corn was eaten on the morrow after the Passover in the new land. And the distinction of the new and old is made between new and old, right, of the harvest. Even though they had to parch it to make it digestible when they entered the land to eat it. So both old and new were there, I think. So... Um, and the man ceased the day they ate the barley. I think he said parched. The day they ate the parched barley, which was the new harvest in the new year, from the day they ate that, the manna ceased. So for the previous two weeks, the manna was still there, and they were still eating it. And so from the day of the wave chief offering, when you can eat the harvest of the land of this next year, the manna stopped on that this day, the day of the wave chief offering. Bang, no more manna after 40 years. Yes, this is an important day and it's worth a few hours of our time. It's not an inconvenience. It's a holy day anyway this year, but that's unusual. 
usually not on a, the first or last hiding of unleavened bread. It generally it falls during the week. But we would keep it on whatever day it falls. And uh, so today is just a, a bit more uh, useful discussion and, and helpful uh, study. Okay, now Messiah was resurrected. And this, I think, is, was partially a, a jealousy offering that was acceptable. Uh, but there's an important point that the one I'd like to make here because I know this isn't accepted by many people. John 21, the first day of the week, today, our Roman Sunday, Miriam Magdalene came to, to uh, the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So that's probably Miriam from Magdala, a, 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 a territory or a city in uh, southern Jerusalem. So in the early hours of the morning, while it was still dark, before first light on Sunday morning, um, Miriam, or Mary Magdalene, that came to the tomb, found Christ already rejected. The same concept is found in Luke. First, Luke 24, 1, in the first day of the week, early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher bringing spices, which they had prepared and others with them. Um, John 20, 15 to 17, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And she supposed him to be the gardener and said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where have you laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus, Jesus said to her, Mary, Miriam, and uh, turned to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, teacher. Jesus said to her, Don't hold me. I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God, your God and my God. So his God is the same God we worship, and that's who he serves, the one true God. He's not God. He didn't claim to be God the Father. He didn't claim to be anything. He didn't claim to be your creator. He said he, he came to do the will of his Father and to say only what he was told to say, nothing else. And he did it properly, typically. And then we decide, now he's the creator of the whole universe and you have to worship him. But that's just, that's just a satanic thought process going on there to make sure our brains are cluttered. This plan of God is simple. And if we think simply about it, um, children hearing this look when the law is read understood it. But they hadn't been overeducated like we've been. We've, we've got our brains so cluttered with gibberish and we're so overeducated. We actually think we know what we're talking about. These people do. You simply think, you're not being simple minded. You think, think simply. Black or white? Yes or no? Letter of the law, spiritual application of the law. Most of those you can make a judgment on. Your relationship with people, make them contractual. And then so your relationship is governed with your brethren or your or people in your community exactly the same as your relationship is with your father. It's contractual. There's nothing wrong with it. And then that can't be changed if, oh, I, th I really meant this and I thought I said that. No, it takes a few minutes to write something down. Both of you sign it and I get a few witnesses. Jeremiah did. He put his seal, which means signature, on the document that gives him title to a piece of property in Jerusalem. And I don't think it's been destroyed in all the pillaging that's been going on there for 2,500 years. What do you bet at the resurrection? Jeremiah is going to walk over there and down in the ground five feet, he's going to pull out this jar. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, now this is, uh, now I remember. There's nothing wrong with making agreements and contracts. People that don't oh, I'm not signing anything. Oh, really? Okay, be careful. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here, but the point is, uh, he did not let anyone touch him as he's ascending to his father. In other words, he was resurrected at close to dark on the, the night before Sabbath. So here we are close to 12 hours later, because you're close to the equinox, so you're gonna have a fairly close 12 hour period of dark, right? And here we are sunrise. Don't touch me, I have not yet ascended to my father. I would assert that he's waiting for the third hour. All right, so the third hour of the sun up, Miriam's, Miriam's there right at, right at twilight, right? And he has to wait for three hours to be the acceptable sacrifice. He ain't going when he wants. He certainly couldn't go all night. And he's there at 
daybreak, and he will be waiting. I'm, it's my assertion only, only, right? But I would assert that he's waiting till the third hour, at which he goes, he's accepted, and then he comes back. And when he comes back, everybody's touching him because he's been acceptable. He hasn't got polluted. He hasn't, his feet aren't dirty, you know, or anything like that. So, I mean, that's what I take out of it because he's fulfilling every single part in the plan of reconciliation according to the sacrificial system of the temple. 100%. And here he is on the first day of the week at daybreak. Don't touch me. Three hours later, he's with Thomas. Or was it just, I forget what the time was. We can maybe look that up later. When he re started reappearing and allowing people to touch him. I think it was late morning. But anyway, we can verify that and maybe add it to, to the paper. But you can see he's uh, already resurrected. Now, it's not claimed he was resurrected on Sunday morning. No, he was resurrected the night before, the end of the Sabbath, exactly three days. And we should understand that. So he was the blood sacrifice that fulfilled all the, the terms of the, of the offering. This is partly a jealousy offering. Why? Because God Almighty is jealous for his, for his children. And if you're going to attack his children, you better be careful. Better be careful what we do and say it's about other people. But uh, pointing out error is one thing, but uh, attacking is uh, something quite different. Okay, the uh, wave or sheaf offering, the first fruits of all the harvest, we read Exodus 29, uh, 24 to 27. All these in the hands of Aaron, the hands of his sons, wave them for an offering before Jehovah. Uh, you shall then take them from their hands and burn them. In addition to the burnt offering, it's a pleading odor to the Lord. It is an offering by fire to Jehovah. You shall take the breast of a ram, so that's the right front leg generally, of Aaron's ordination and wave it for a wave offering. So it wasn't just a grain was a wave offering. That's why it was a bit, this discussion over, no, it's got to be a grain offering. It's got to be ground. It can't be a sheaf because sheaf is the wrong word of translation, and you have to wave the ground millet or barley. Okay, so what's with this? Aaron's ordination and wave for a wave offered before Jehovah, it shall be your portion, Aaron. So now they're waving their, the right front leg of a, of a sheep, right? Not barley harvest, not a grain harvest, not a grain with a whole bunch of little pellets, which means all of the... Uh, of the, the, the converted individuals of 2,000 years are the first fruits. You become that from the from Pentecost harvest. You're the second harvest. We're the second harvest, right? Jesus Christ was the first of the first fruits. We are first fruits of the second harvest. And then following up will be the, uh, uh, the, the those that have the second death and the second resurrection. So uh, just keep that in mind when, when people challenge you on certain things because uh, usually there's a fairly simple answer and, and uh, usually it's not too complicated to understand. This may have been a peace offering as well as the LLC offering, so anyway, we can maybe think about that as well. But it's for the consecration of a priest. Now, Jesus Christ was descended from Judah and Levi, which is why he could be the high priest of the new order of Melchizedek as high priest, because he was from Levi, or actually from uh, from a Cohen, and he was from Judah, so he can return as king. So he can fulfill both offices as a descendant of David and as a descendant of the Zadokites, right, as a high priest of the order of Melchizedek. So he's fulfilling every single physical component of the offertory program, as well as all the spiritual outline, double. So uh, just keep that in mind. Okay, say to Leviticus 7, 729, save the people of Israel. He that offers a sacrifice of his peace offerings to Jehovah shall bring his offering to Jehovah and from the sacrifice of his peace offerings. He shall bring with his own hands the offerings by fire to Jehovah. Shall bring the fat with the breast. The breast may be waved as a wave offering before Jehovah. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons. So you've got to, like we barbecue, 
the fat goes off into the fire, adds to the flavor of the meat, but then the meat is for Aaron and his sons. goes to the priest. If you see that, right? So there's more to this concept of this offertory and offering than, than you know we sometimes uh, deal with. But this wave chief first had to be accepted, uh, then he could return to fulfill the, the next part of, his, of the outline of the plan of, of the re redemption of mankind. So um, just keep in mind that when they're talking about a wave chief, you can just, I just read two, I've got about a dozen here, scriptures that's talking about portions of a lamb being waved as a wave offering. So it is not simply isolated to omers and sheaths of barley. Ground or not ground. Because if they're green, well, go ahead and grind them. And good luck. You won't be eating anything. It'll just be squished and, and full of moisture. It's got to have enough ripening so that the parching will dry them enough so your body can digest them. And that's just, it changes from year to year according to weather conditions. You know, certain parts of the year, you know, it may be close every year, but this year there was no barley and the Karaites had to delay the start of the year by a month. I'm going to have to check on that just to make sure that was correct, but uh, I think you'll find that the barley wasn't up. So they had to change it by a whole month. So all the Karaites everywhere else on the planet that are trying to keep it, now it can be notified in about 20 seconds because he got an email, right? Bang. No, it's not up. We can't keep it. The year doesn't start for another month, right? Well, that's fine today. If you were emasculated, if you miss Passover, you better keep it on the second month or you're cut out. You don't do a day of atonement, you're gone. You better, you know, so, I mean, some of this is more, more serious than it may, than it seems to be taken. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what's going on? We're responsible for what we do and think, so that's enough of a problem. We're enough of our own problem. But you do need to know what's going on because you will be challenged on it sooner or later, I'm sure. Okay. Wave sheaf of green ears offered in, to Israel. Uh, it wasn't strictly gathered at Jerusalem. Today it is, you see, because the Karaites were under a death sentence from rabbinic Judaism. Up until about 200 years ago, was, they were to be killed by Maimonides, published it, right? When you find these, you're to stab them in the back like a fish and gut them, make sure they die in pain, right, of torturing them. That's what you're to do with the Karaites. They, they keep the literal plan of God the best they can by the keep perpetrators of the oral law. Well, they don't like you finding some of this stuff and reading it or publishing it. That's the penalty they were, the Karaites are under. So I have the greatest respect for them. They've never fought back, like, you know, they're a bit like Mennonites and Serbs that are, we would call pacifists, but they weren't passive about keeping the terms of the covenant as they understood it. That's why I have the greatest respect for them. And yet, it, it's regrettable, you can see that, that uh, uh, that's how they're governing the start of the year, as, as uh, not related to any historical background to it. It's just the, the harvest because, and they're relating it to a harvest in Egypt, which would have been two or three weeks ahead. Egypt was much hotter and much drier than the, the territory of Judea up near Jerusalem. You know, so that harvest would have been ripe. So anyway, that's, uh, that's what's going on. It could have been a two or three weeks uh, difference in the harvest. And see, the importance of this day for our purposes as well, though it commences a countdown at Pentecost. So from today, here's your first week of the count of Pentecost. If this had been the last day, that would have been your first week, so you would have had a, you'd be one week later on the Gregorian calendar, not on God's calendar. So that's why we have to be careful where we're comparing uh, Gregorian dates and God's dates and when the start of the year is correctly. And once we know when it is, we can publish a document for the whole year or it can't be in any trouble. We can publish it for many years in the future because the astronomical cycle is dependable and the growth of barley isn't. It can vary by weeks every year, and it did this year, and the Karaites had to delay their start of the year by a month because the barley wasn't up. But we can verify that afterwards, so I think I'll close with that and uh, can have a bit of a break and then discuss whatever you would like. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, James. Uh, sorry, I want to apologize. I said it was a message with, uh, that was uh, recorded by, by Dave, but uh, I should have listened to uh, at least uh, the start. Uh, it looked like it was from, from Dave, but uh, again, my mistake. Uh, thank you also, uh, James, for uh, stressing the importance of, uh, of the calendar and how uh, if the uh, on the first pan coast, if, if the people have not been there uh, gathered at nine o'clock coming for the uh, morning service, exactly uh, 50 days after the uh, wave chief offering, then I mean, uh, they, would have, they would have missed the uh, receipt of the uh, of the Holy Spirit. So uh, it is a reminder for us to uh, to be uh, uh, to be there when when uh, ask, uh, Jehovah asks us to be there uh, and to worship Him on the days uh, that He has uh, set uh, aside uh, for us to uh, to be there. As as I said, um, yes, we uh, are starting the countdown to Pentecost, and uh, how privileged we are to be uh, the first fruits of the next uh, harvest which is uh, in 50 days exactly. Uh, we should be grateful for that. Uh, of all the uh, of all the children that uh, Yehovah has created, uh, he has set aside a few. And we are, uh, we are those few if we are faithful to the end. OK, well, we uh, will rise one more time. And this time we will. Uh, we will sing of mercy and of justice. Uh, it is uh, on page 77 of your hymnal. So if you would uh, please rise. It's from Psalm 101 on page 77. It's called, I'll sing of mercy and justice. After which I would like to ask um, James to close uh, the service with, with, with prayer. Uh, Hopefully, James will uh, have uh, sound this time. Uh, but before, let's sing on page 77. I will sing of mercy and of justice.
Okay, well, please remain uh, standing and uh, we'll uh, ask now James to uh, close in prayer. So James, over to you. Look like we uh, we lost James again. Uh, not sure if he will uh, return. Um, Jerry, could you uh, could you do the closing prayer, please? Jerry, can you hear me? No. Can how about now, friends? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can, I can hear you, friends. Well, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you do the closing prayer, Jerry? Uh, yeah, I, like I said, it just takes me a minute to plug back in. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Our Father, the Most High God, who art in heaven, Jehovah of hosts, we have come before you this day, the day that thou Son was given to you as a perfect sacrifice on our behalf, and you accepted it. We give you the greatest thanks and appreciation, Father, the giving of thy son and accepting his sacrifice on our behalf. We thank you with the greatest thanks that is in us. We come before thy presence and we sing songs before you on this joyous day. And it's our greatest thanks that we have this understanding of the importance of this day and of the meaning and of the wave sheaf offering and of the meaning of thy son's sacrifice and his perfect offering to thee. We thank you, Father, for this means of getting together. And we pray before thee to watch over thy people throughout the world and that this message will get out and more people get understanding and come to thee and repent of the sins that we have committed before thee. We pray, Father, that thou will guide us with thy spirit and that'll create in us clean hearts and renew right spirits within us. Again, we give you the greatest thanks and appreciation for this means to get together and for the understanding that we have of this day. And we thank, ask you to bless the meals that we will take today. And as we prepare for the last great uh, high day tomorrow, we ask this all in the name of thy beloved son, Yahushua, Father, amen.